I get the question a lot, why are the words Christian and science put together? You know, those seem mutually exclusive. So, a science, any science, is a body of knowledge governed by law that you can learn and practice. So, Christian science is the knowledge of God governed by divine laws that you can learn and practice. So, and the reason it's called Christian science is Christ Jesus came to present this knowledge of God and these divine laws for us to learn and practice. So that's Christian science. You can call it divine science or spiritual science, but it's Christian science because it's what Jesus came to present. And then the other question that Evan also dealt with and um, I get a lot is about, well, you know, who is Mary Baker Eddy? And Evan did a great job of describing that, but I just wanna add just one little thing to this, and that is, you know, there are lots of well, spiritually minded women, and there's lots of women who are devout Christians and turn to God for healing and, and even have healings. So what was different about Mary Baker Eddy? Well, for me, what was different about Mary Baker Eddy is that when she had these spiritual experiences and she had this healing, she actually didn't think it was a miracle she actually began to feel like there was a law of God operating here. And she turned back to the Bible, which she was familiar with, but she turned back to the Bible to try and discern a little bit more about, well, what were these spiritual laws of God? And that's, I think, what she discovered, these spiritual laws of God that Christ Jesus presented. Now, I just have to say, Mary Baker Eddy did not invent them. She did not invent Christian science. She discovered the laws of God that she then explained in her book, Science and Health, that we can practice and learn. Okay, then one other little thing before I start. In my specific talk, I'm gonna be talking about a, a lot of healings and um, how these healings happen and so forth. So when I'm talking about a specific problem or disease or situation, your situation might be completely different, but the spiritual idea, that key for this other person, could be exactly the spiritual idea that you need. I mean, does that make sense? So with every healing, let's not focus on what the problem is. Instead, let's focus on what was the spiritual solution? What was the key to that healing, the spiritual idea? And then, then you can take all of these spiritual ideas and use all of them for your own situation. Okay? Great. All right, so let's launch off here. I'm gonna start off by telling you a healing. This is a young woman who had two small children. She was the sole support of her family. And um, she was in a job where she worked 12 hours a day on her feet. And she began to have uh, some pain and problem with her feet and legs, and she went to her doctor, and, um, and he diagnosed rheumatoid arthritis. And he gave her some suggestions about, you know, getting off her feet and so forth and so on. And she really tried to do this, but she had this job and these two small children, and it was a little difficult to do. And, and the problem kept getting worse and worse until she could really not walk hardly at all. And she went back to the doctor and, and he told her that he would, she would have to quit her job and she would be um, bedridden. And uh, so she struggled back to work after that doctor's appointment for her last afternoon. And a customer came in and saw her in obvious distress and asked her what was wrong. And this dear woman just burst into tears and told her everything that had been happening and what the doctor said and the prognosis and diagnosis. And, and the customer said, oh my dear, that is not God's will for you. And then she said, Jesus beheld in science the perfect man. Now that phrase, is from a longer statement in the book, Science and Health, with key to the scriptures that Evan was talking about. And I put it on your handout here. And it's uh, the page 476. Since we all have this, let's read this aloud together, shall we? Jesus beheld in science the perfect man who appeared to him where sinning mortal man appears to mortals. 
In this perfect man, the Savior saw God's own likeness, and this correct view of man healed the sick. Now that's what that customer was thinking about. And then she said to the woman, you know, if I give you a book, will you read it? And she went out to her car and got a copy of Science and Health with key to the scriptures. And I understand that they have some of the Bible and Science and Health out there for sale. So if you, didn't, if you don't own a copy of this, don't leave home without it here. Be sure and get a copy before you go. Anyway, the, the woman uh, took the book home and, and she said she read Science and Health every moment she could. And after 10 days, there was a crisis. And she determined that she was just going to read Science and Health until she had her healing. And so she was reading all night. And early in the morning, the pain broke. And she felt that she was healed. And she just determined that when the, the morning came, she was going to get up and get dressed and go to work. And she did that. She showed up. They gave her a shift. And she was able to work that entire shift without any pain, without any problem. And she was completely cured. Some weeks later, that customer came back. And the woman ran up to her and thanked her for her healing. And the customer said, oh, my dear, I didn't do anything. She said, that was the law of God that healed you. Now, that's the first key that I want you to take away with you. There is a law of God operating in your life. Now, this law of God is something like the law of aerodynamics. Do we have any pilots here? Are there any pilots? Any pilots? A few pilots? OK. Anybody fly? Anybody ever been in a plane? <laughs> Anyone ever been in a plane? OK. We've all been in planes. So you know that there are laws of aerodynamics. And these laws of aerodynamics you know, operate and planes fly. So, and these laws of aerodynamics have always, always been. But for most of human history, people didn't think that you could fly, right? I mean, cavemen couldn't fly. <laughs> Medieval priests talked about, oh, nobody can fly. They were sure no one could fly. Now, mid, now, Leonardo da Vinci, in the Middle Ages, he made some drawings, and he thought you might be able to fly, but he couldn't make it practical. It wasn't until 1903 when the Wright brothers discovered something about the laws of aerodynamics, and they were able to get a plane to fly for a few minutes, and then half an hour, and then they were flying. And it seemed like once one person discovered something about the laws of flight, well, it seemed like everybody was discovering this. You had people in Germany and France and England, and they're all discovering these laws of aerodynamics, and they're all flying. Now, were these laws of aerodynamics functioning in Leonardo da Vinci's day? Yes. But it took someone to discover enough about the laws and make them practical. And then once one person was able to do this, it seemed like everyone was able to do this. Well, that one person was Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus came to present these divine laws of God, and he made them practical and illustrated how you could use the laws of God and demonstrate salvation and healing. So Jesus did this. And so spiritual healing, the laws have been discovered. Fortunately, just like the laws of aerodynamics and flying in a plane, you don't need to know all about the laws of aerodynamics in order to get in a plane and fly. That's a good thing or I would have never gotten here. <laughs> have to have enough confidence to get in the plane. And then those laws operate and the plane flies. So it's the same thing with spiritual healing. You just have to have enough confidence and conviction in the power of God to sort of get in that spiritual plane and let God take you 
all the way to your healing. And you know, I, uh, I actually grew up in Dayton, Ohio, and that's where the Wright brothers were from. And uh, I used to ride my bike past their house, and so we used to hear about them all the time and uh, in school. And you know, they had a lot of failures. Um, there was a field out there outside of town, and they would experiment there, and they were failing all the time. But, but they learned something from each one of those failures, and they weren't discouraged by those failures. And you know, I find that very encouraging with spiritual healing, too. You know, those laws are right there, and they're operating. But if you're having some failures, let's learn something from that, because the laws do operate and you're learning something, you're getting closer to understanding how those laws work each time. So don't worry about the failure. Just keep going forward knowing that the law functions. So let's talk a little about some of these spiritual laws. Let's say what I'm thinking was one of the first spiritual laws in the Bible, and I put it on your sheet here. It's from Genesis 1, verse 31. And how about everybody read that for me? And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And so this is our first law of God. God is good. God is infinite good. God is all good. God is only good. God is the source of good. And God did not create disease. Now, let me show you how you can use this law, put this law to work in a healing prayer. So a woman had uh, discovered a lump in her breast. And she decided to call me as a Christian science practitioner. Now, a Christian science practitioner is someone who prays with people and prays for people for healing. And this woman had experienced some healings before, and so she had a conviction in the power of God. You know, whenever I'm praying for someone, first thing I do is I just silently turn to God and ask, how should I pray? Because there's lots of effective ways of praying. So how should I pray in this case? So when this woman was talking with me on the phone, the thought that came to me was Genesis 1:31. And we actually read it aloud together that God is good, only good. God didn't create disease. And then another Bible verse came to me, and I put it here in your sheet. It's Ephesians 4, verse 6. And let's read this aloud together, but as we do, I want you to be thinking about God is good as you read this, okay? One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. I mean, do you have this sense of God being all good, only good? Well, we talked about this for a few minutes, then we hung up. And you know, that's something else about Christian science practice and Christian science healing. You're not talking somebody into health. So um, you don't have to be on the phone all the time with someone. And, and you don't actually even have to be in the same place where that person is. Because it's God that heals. And God is there. So a lot of Christian science prayer is your communion with God. And so I was just turning to God silently and just really knowing and affirming that God was all good, the allness of good. And that was all that was going on. Well, she called me in the morning and the lump was gone. She was completely cured. Now, how does quick healing like this happen? My experience is that quick healing happens when there's no fear. Now, this woman was never afraid. She never associated disease with herself. She really understood that God was all good. God didn't create disease. And so it wasn't associated with her. It wasn't a part of her. And that was the quick healing. There was no fear. Well, you could be sitting there thinking, good for her. 
But I have a lot of fear. You know, I'm full of fear. I've been dealing with this for a long time. I'm full of fear. So let's talk about some specific laws to help you overcome fear. Okay? So our first law of God to overcome fear is from Matthew 19, verse 26. How about you read this aloud for me? Jesus. All things are possible with God. This is our first law of God to overcome fear. All things are possible with God. Now, you know, we've all heard this. Jesus said this. In fact, this is such a popular saying. I actually have a license plate on the front of our car that says all things are possible with God. But actually, I've found that um, even though you're really familiar with this, there can be a tendency to think, oh, I absolutely believe this. All things are possible with God, except this one thing that I'm facing right now. <laughs> But actually, when Jesus said this, he really meant all things are possible with God. And let me illustrate how you can use this in a healing prayer. So as Madeline mentioned, my uh, family came into Christian science when my great-grandmother was uh, healed of tuberculosis. And this was the end of the last century in the late 1800s. But as Paul, uh, Paul Harvey would say, uh, let me tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> so, so. Um, my great-grandfather uh, was a very wealthy man, and he owned this company, and they had a lot of money, and they had two homes, one in New York, one in New Orleans, and my grandfather at the time was about 12 years old, and, and he, um, he was the oldest of five children, and he remembers all the big parties and the, you know, the uh, going back and forth between the two houses and so on. And anyway, something happened in the late 1800s. And either it was the economy or just my, grand, uh, my great grandfather's company, but he lost everything. He lost his company. He lost all the money. He lost both houses. And then he left my great grandmother for another woman. Oh my God. And he left her no money, no houses, five children, and she was ill with tuberculosis. So a relative had this little cottage down on the Gulf Coast near Biloxi and got all the family and ensconced them in the house and left them there. And a neighbor, after a couple of weeks, had seen all these children out playing but never saw an adult. And so went to investigate and found my great-grandmother dying of tuberculosis. Now that neighbor was a Christian scientist and told her something about science and health. Now, my great-grandmother was a very religious woman. She'd grown up in the church. She'd been raised in the church. She had a great confidence in God. And she just grabbed onto science and health like it was a lifeline. And she was healed. She was healed of tuberculosis. My grandfather, at age 12, uh, quit school, went to work in a grocery store, and was supporting the family. People in the community found out about the family, began helping them and supporting them and so forth. My grandfather was able to go back to school. He graduated from high school. And he was able to help all the rest of his siblings either go to business college or graduate from college through scholarships and his support. And he never went to college, but he taught in college, so he had his, his experience. But my great-grandmother really demonstrated all things are possible with God. Now you hold on to that. No matter what you're facing, all things are possible with God. There is a um, phrase in Science and Health that I often put together with this one. And it's on page 454. Let's read this aloud together, shall we? The understanding, even in a degree, of the divine all power destroys fear and plants the feet in the true path, the path which leads to the house built without hands, eternal 
in the heavens. Even a little understanding of God. Hold on to that, and that will destroy fear. Okay, our next law of God to destroy fear, to heal. And it's also in the Bible. It's Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Let's read this aloud together, shall we? There is therefore now... Affirm your innocence. Paul's saying, you are not guilty. You know, how often do we start our prayers actually feeling that we aren't worthy? Maybe we're not worthy of healing. We're feeling guilty about something. We're feeling we're not good enough. Or maybe we don't know enough. We don't understand enough. But Paul is saying, you are worthy. You are innocent. What if you started your prayer knowing that God loved and approved of you? And you are worthy. You know, we often, we end our prayers that way. But if we started our prayer that way, knowing your innocence. Now let me illustrate how you can use this in a healing prayer. A fellow I know, a uh, single guy, lived in an apartment by himself and one day he decided to clean out his kitchen. <laughs> he hadn't done it very often. And uh, so he's underneath the sink and he noticed there's a canister of kitchen chemicals and it sort of rusted through, and, but there was a lot of the chemicals left. So he poured it into a plastic cup, about eight or 12 ounces there, and, and he was looking for some other container to put it in. And, sort of lost interest in this project and sort of went on. And the next day he was out playing a couple of sets of tennis and came in when it was dusk and he was hot and thirsty and he goes to the refrigerator to pull out his gallon of orange juice and he goes to pour it into the first available cup and he drinks about half of it before he realizes that was the kitchen chemicals. And he's having all of this reaction and his throat's burning and all these things are happening. And he remembered the entire, you know, danger warning on the back of the canister. And he did what any young man would do in this situation. He called his mother. <laughs> <laughs> and he sort of gasped out what had happened. And she immediately began praying for him and said that she was gonna call a Christian science practitioner and told him to hang up and to call me in, in a few minutes. And so she called me, and as soon as she started talking, I just silently turned to God and asked, now how should we pray? And the first thing that came to me was Romans 8. And I thought, absolutely, we are going to know that this man has never made a mistake. He is not guilty. Now I'm talking spiritually here, aren't I? He is not guilty guilty. He is innocent. He has never made a mistake. He is not, um, he's not guilty. <laughs> and so I talked to her about this. We read this uh, for a moment on the, on the phone. And then we got off the phone and he called me. And, um, and I read this to him. And I said, now we are going to immediately just put out of thought this whole thing about you've made this big mistake and so you have these penalties and so forth. I said, we're gonna put that out of thought because we don't have time for this. <laughs> we need to go right directly to the spiritual truth and the healing. So let's go right directly to the fact of your spiritual innocence. God sees you as innocent. You are worthy of healing. So I got off the phone and that's how I was praying. He told me later that you know, he was so panicked. There were all these symptoms happening. And, but as he thought about, he was innocent. He said he began to calm down, and he began to think about how God was always there to meet every need. And he began thinking more about God. He said suddenly the symptoms just stopped. They stopped. And he was healed. 
And that was the end of the problem. He never had any more symptoms of poisoning. That was over. All the uh, burning problems in the throat and so forth, that was healed within two or three days. And he was completely healed. There were no ramifications for that from that experience at all. Know your innocence. This is a powerful way to pray. Start your prayer by knowing you are worthy, you're not guilty, you are innocent. Mrs. Eddy has this short little phrase. And I, I love to think of this when I'm thinking about Romans 8. And it's from page 568. Let's read this aloud together. Innocence and truth overcome guilt and error. Just simple. All right, let's look at another law of God to remove fear. And this is from John 4. Now, I've got verses 12 and 18 in your uh, handout. But actually, for those of you interested in this kind of thing, it actually starts with verse 7 and goes all the way to the end of that chapter. But let's just read these two verses aloud together, shall we? 12 and 18. Can you start that off for me? Perfect love casts out fear. I'm going to make a little admission to you all. For years, I would read this passage, and I knew it was a healing passage. I knew people had healings with this, so I knew it was important to understand. But I'd read this passage, and as soon as I read perfect love casts out fear, I think, oh, but I think of some time when I hadn't been very loving or something that I'd said that wasn't very loving. And I think, but I don't have perfect love. So if I don't have perfect love, then I can't cast out fear. And then I'd get more afraid, and it just all sort of went downhill. But, but this is something I just want to encourage you with. If you're working with a Bible passage, and you know that it's a healing passage, and you just don't get it, you don't understand it, don't give up on that. Keep working with that. Because your spiritual sense is growing and gaining and, and keep returning. And that's the same thing with a passage in science and health. Maybe you read something, you open the book and you read something, you go, what in the world? But if you don't understand that, just you know, put it aside for the moment, but keep coming back to that. Because as you grow spiritually closer to God, there'll come the moment when you, you, you look at that passage, you think, oh my goodness, I get that. And that's what happened to me. So I was you know, looking at this passage again one day, and I thought, and you already have already figured this out, I'm sure. I looked at this and I thought, oh, perfect love is talking about God. It's God. God is perfect love, and God casts out fear. It's not my human love. It's not based on me. It's God. Perfect love casts out fear. Oh, made all the difference. Anyway, um, let's talk about how you can use this in a healing prayer. So a woman uh, discovered a discoloration on her back, and um, it was about, grew to be about the size of her hand, and the, the, the skin felt weird, and, and her husband looked at this, and, and he was very concerned. He thought it was cancer, and he wanted her to um, go to the doctor and have an operation and so forth, and she said, well, I am doing something about this. She said, I'm praying, but oh, he was so upset. So she decided to call a Christian science practitioner, and and so when she called me, and I'm just praying about how should we pray, and, and the thought came to me of 1 John 4 about perfect love casts out fear. And we read this together, and she said, oh, I'm not afraid. My husband is, but I'm not afraid. <laughs> but you know, this actually brings up an important point in mental and metaphysical healing. Sometimes it's not just your thought about things. Sometimes you really do need to handle the fear and thought of the people around you. And it could be the, the workplace or your family or maybe just even general thought in the community about something. You don't want to ignore that. And so we talked about how God, perfect love, could cast out his fear that he had a relationship to God. He had a relation to God. And that 
relation could, he could feel that power of God and God could remove his fear. And then also worked with another Bible passage and it is um, here, Matthew 5, verse 48. Let's read this aloud together. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And I'm just going to summarize that as perfect God, perfect man and woman. Now, I'm not standing up here saying we are all perfect human beings. That's not what Jesus is saying in this uh, passage here. Jesus was talking about perfect God, and because God is perfect, everything God does, everything God creates is perfect. That's spiritually perfect. You have a perfect spiritual identity. God is perfect. God does not make mistakes. And God has created you with a perfect spiritual identity. And so that's how we prayed together. And you know, I looked up every single Bible passage that talked about perfect. You can do this too. You can go onto the computer and, and go to any Bible program and type in perfect. And all the verses in the Bible that talk about perfect will pop up. And you can apply every single verse. To yourself. And actually, you can do the same for science and health. You can go to the site christianscience.com and look around on that site for Concord Express. It stands for concordance, Concord Express. And you can put in the word perfect and it will give you passages in science and health. And you can apply those passages on perfect to yourself. And I looked up all those passages and applied every single one to her. This was not an instant healing. She said as she was praying with these ideas, she said at some point, she just stopped watching the body. She stopped checking the body. And then as she continued praying with these ideas, she said at some point, she just began thanking God for her healing. She just knew that she was healed, but she wasn't checking the body. And there came the day when her husband came up to her with great delight and said, you know, there's not a mark on your back. The skin is all new. There's not a mark on your back. And she was completely cured. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect God has created you with a perfect spiritual identity. Let's go to another law. Now this law, I'm going to summarize as reverse the belief. Reverse the belief. Now let's read a passage in Science and Health aloud together, and then I'm going to explain what I mean by reverse the belief. And the passage here is page 392. Let's read this short paragraph aloud together, shall we? Reverse the case. Stan Porter at the door of thought, admitting only such conclusions as you wish realized. So reverse the belief. What this means is take the leading thought or thing that's worrying you in your mind and then know the exact opposite. So let's say, for example, you're dealing with pain. So what's the exact opposite of pain? You have to speak a little louder. You don't have a mic. Peace, harmony, pain-less, freedom healthiness. Good. These are all good. So you're feeling a lot of pain. So the first thing you do is you reverse the belief and you begin affirming 
For example, I have peace. I have all the peace of God. God gives me peace. God is filling me with peace. I'm the reflection of peace. Or God is giving me freedom. I have all the freedom of God. God is the source of my freedom. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm affirming the spiritual fact, but I'm seeing God as the source of that and seeing my relation to God. So let's do another one. Let's say you're feeling weakness. You're feeling weak. So what's the opposite of weakness? Strength. strength. So you begin affirming, I have the strength of God. God has given me strength. I have infinite strength. God is the source of my strength. And you continue affirming the spiritual fact until you find yourself agreeing with it instead of arguing with it. Let's try one more. Uh, discouragement. You're feeling discouraged. What's the opposite? Confidence. Encouragement, confidence, conviction. So instead of feeling discouraged, you exact opposite. I have confidence. I have conviction in the power of God. God has given me conviction of the truth. I am feeling confident. God has given me this confidence. God gives me infinite confidence. You see, you see how I'm doing this? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a few more passages in Science and Health that talk about this particular method of overcoming fear. Um, page 113 here, there's no pain in truth and no truth in pain. Now, in this particular passage, I wanna make sure you go all the way to affirming what is true. You don't wanna just stop with saying, well, this isn't true. You want to understand what is true. You want to go all the way to affirming what the spiritual fact is, what God is doing. You see the difference? Okay, so go all the way there to uh, the spiritual truth. You know, this is not ignoring a problem. You're not ignoring a problem by doing this. What you're doing is you're not being overwhelmed by a problem. And you are going immediately to the spiritual idea and affirming that until you're feeling that. Um, then page 468, you know, 468 here, this paragraph is so popular with uh, people who study Christian science, they've actually given it a name. This paragraph is called the scientific statement of being. And it's very, very spiritual. And the first time you look at this, you might think, oh, I don't know, that's too spiritual for me. But, but keep working with this, keep working with this, because at some point, you know, that spiritual sense will really begin making sense to you. And, um, and then 397. Now this, this is talking about an accident uh, case. And so let's read this paragraph aloud together, shall we? Now reverse the process. So let me show you how you can use this in a healing prayer. A fellow I know was coming back from driving on the freeway, coming back from East Tennessee. He's in the mountains late at night, and he sees uh, this, the, these headlights, this vehicle coming up very fast in back of him. And he's rear-ended, and uh, his car flips, and it rolls over his two lanes and over the median and over the other two lanes and slams into the stone embankment. Just before he was hit, and he saw this happening, um, he said he actually prayed out loud, God is all, God is good, and God help me. And he said on the first roll, when his head hit the roof, he said he just felt a softness there, like he was wrapped in divine love. And when he slammed up against the stone embankment on the other side, he said he just began praying out loud every single prayer he could remember. He said he prayed the Lord's Prayer. He prayed every Bible verse he'd ever memorized. He prayed every line from science and health he knew. He actually prayed that scientific statement of being. Let's just read these first two lines of that scientific statement of being, and I think you'll see how relevant it was for him at that moment. 
There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation. For God is all in all. And mind, capital M, mind, is another name for God. And so he was thinking about God being all in all. God, divine mind, not matter, being all in all. And he was the manifestation of God mind. Anyway, concerned motorist stop came up to him, asked if she could help him, and he said he just didn't think that he could stop praying to talk to her. <laughs> so he kept praying out loud, and she went away. She called 911. A little while later, she came back, and she asked if she could call someone for him. And so he gave her the name of a Christian science friend who she called, and that friend then called a Christian science practitioner to pray for him and got on the road right away to come out and, and get him. Well, the emergency vehicles came, and it took a couple of hours, but they extracted him from the car and took him to the local hospital. And he was diagnosed with cracked ribs, a bruised hip, compressed vertebrae in the neck, bruises, and he wasn't able to see out of his left eye. It was um, sort of disconnected somehow. Anyway, so his friend came, and he checked himself out of the hospital so he could go home with his friend. Now, this was not an instantaneous healing. But he was completely cured of all the problems, and he has 20-20 vision in both eyes. He said he worked with all of these laws of God. He knew that God was good, the source of only good that God did not send evil. He worked on innocence. Now, it was not difficult for him to see his own innocence, but he really prayed to see the innocence of that other driver who never stopped. And he just prayed until he could see their spiritual innocence. When he was discouraged, he would take the exact opposite out of whatever he was thinking about, and he'd start affirming the spiritual facts, whatever the exact opposite was. He was working with perfect God, created him with a perfect spiritual identity, and he reminded himself constantly that all things were possible with God. You know, I saw him at a lecture not so long ago, and he told me, I am grateful beyond words for God's loving and protective care. This experience has given me concrete evidence of the healing power of Christian science. This science is not just a theory, nor is it wishful or hopeful thinking. It's an active, powerful healing agent that transformed my life from the tomb of a broken automobile to a clearer realization of immortal life. Reverse the belief. Affirm the exact spiritual opposite until you're seeing your relation, your connection with God. I think this is something of what Mary Baker Eddy discovered in 1866. That's when she had this you know, important experience for her, this healing that Evan talked about in 1866. And when she talked about that healing later, it was such a spiritual experience. You know, she really just felt the presence of the Holy Spirit with her. And it was such a spiritual experience. She had difficulty talking about it. She kept saying things like, I realized God is my life. But she did finally sort of articulate what she felt was her discovery. And I put this here on your sheet. And I'm just going to read this uh, real quickly here. The term Christian science was introduced by the author to designate the scientific system of divine healing. The revelation consists of two parts. One, the discovery of this divine science of mind healing through a spiritual sense of the scriptures and through the teachings of the comforter as promised by the master. And then two, the proof by present demonstration that the so-called miracles of Jesus did not specially belong to a dispensation now ended, but that they illustrated an ever-operative divine principle that's operating. The laws of God are operating today for you. 
You know, Mary Baker Eddy became a remarkable healer after her own experience. She began, uh, she went back to the Bible to discover more of these spiritual laws, and as she was doing that, she was able to immediately begin healing others. And Evan talked about some wonderful healings that she was involved in. Just a few months after her sort of revelation, which took place in February of 1866, in June of the same year, she was down by the seashore reading her Bible, sort of studying and praying, and she was walking on the beach. She saw this young mother bring her little boy to the beach. The boy was uh, named George, and he was seven years old, but George had never walked. He had a condition known as club feet, which means his feet were deformed, they were turned backwards. So Mrs. Norton, the mother, puts George down the beach, goes off to take care of the horse. She comes back, George is gone. This is odd because George doesn't walk. So she's looking around to see where George has gotten to, and by the seashore she sees this woman, Mary Baker Eddy, walking with George, holding his hands. And then Mary Baker Eddy let go of his hands, and George stood alone for the first time. A while later, he took his own first steps because his feet had moved into their right position. He was completely cured. Now, how does healing like this happen? Well, Mary Baker Eddy describes this mental, spiritual healing mm -hmm in her book, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures. And she summarizes the whole healing method in the first sentence. How convenient is that? And she gives the four elements that are present in a healing prayer. No matter how you're praying, no matter what you're praying about, these four elements are present in a prayer that heals. So I'm gonna read this to you because I forgot to put it in your sheet. So I'm gonna read it to you, but you tell me what the four elements are that are present in a prayer that heals, okay? The prayer that reforms the sinner and heals the sick is an absolute faith that all things are possible to God, a spiritual understanding of him and unselfed love. Do you hear the four elements? What are the four elements? All things are possible to God, absolute faith, spiritual understanding. Now, spiritual understanding means that's when you start with God. You're not starting with a problem. You start with God, something about God, just like we did. And then you see your relation to God. That's spiritual understanding. And then what's the fourth element? Love. Love. Those are the four elements that are present in a healing prayer. You know, I could stand here all day and tell you healings. Um, we've had lots of healings, both in, in the, and you know, you can read about healings. You can read about healings. There's a monthly magazine called the Christian Science Journal. Every month they have healings in that. And um, they have a weekly magazine called the Christian Science Sentinel. Every week they're healings. And you can actually go online now. And it's called JSH Online. Journal, Sentinel, Herald, online, or christianscience.com, and you can read about healings of every problem. You know, my uncle was healed of polio when he was young. Um, he was diagnosed with polio, he couldn't walk, he had to be carried about, and my grandparents worked with science and health and studied these laws of God in the Bible and science and health, and my uncle had a complete healing within the year. In fact, he went on and served in World War II in the OSS. My grandmother on my dad's side was healed of um, a heart condition that was supposed to be fatal. Now, she wasn't religious. She wasn't religious at all. She didn't really even believe in God. Um, she had no religious background. And, um, so when the doctor diagnosed that she had less than six months to live, you know, she and my dad at that time was only six years old and she was so worried about this and she was talking to a neighbor, you know, how are we gonna, who's gonna raise my son? And the neighbor happened to be a Christian scientist and told her about Christian science and science and health and my grandmother said, well, 
I don't actually really believe in God. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, you know, I believe in any of this. And, and this woman said, you know, just take the book and read and take whatever you can understand. And that will be enough. Well, my grandmother was healed. In fact, I knew my grandmother. She lived into her advanced 80s. So whether you have a great conviction in the power of God or you're not even sure there is a God, if you'll just take this book, Science and Health, and just start reading and take what speaks to you, that will be enough. Let me share one more healing and then we'll close. So this is a story about a young girl uh, who uh, had anorexia. And um, actually she was away at school and she wasn't particularly overweight but she decided she really was and so she basically stopped eating. She lost 30% of her body weight. Um, the school became extremely concerned. She had no energy, she was having trouble getting around and they tried to counsel with her. She didn't see that she had a problem. They finally called her parents because they were afraid she was gonna die and they just couldn't have that at the school. Called the parents to come and get her and the parents are trying to talk with her and she doesn't have a problem. So the parents called a Christian science practitioner to pray for them because remember, she didn't have a problem. And so one of the first effects of that prayer was this girl decided she might have a problem. And so she became willing to talk to the practitioner. And she told me later that that practitioner never talked about the body, never talked about food. The practitioner started talking about spiritual qualities, like in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. So let's read this aloud together. And as we're reading this, identify yourself with these spiritual qualities, okay? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, long-suffering means patience, and temperance, that means self-control. So, you know, when you look at a, a list of good qualities like this, you might be thinking, oh, yeah, I have this quality and that one. Oh, no. Nope. Don't have that one. <laughs> Ooh, I used to have that one. That was before the kids. <laughs> I don't have that one anymore. <laughs> but you actually have all the good qualities. You have all the qualities of God. You don't have to earn them. You don't even have to deserve them. God gives them to you. They're God's gifts to you. And you have these qualities. So she began thinking about these qualities that God had given to her, that she had, that she didn't have to earn. She had them. And the more she began to identify herself with these spiritual qualities, she said there'd been a darkness in her life. And suddenly, she felt like there was a light. A light came on in her life, and a light came on in her thought. Well, that was the light of the Christ that was coming to her. She began to eat and eat normally. She regained a normal, healthy body weight, and she has never had another eating disorder the rest of her life. And this was decades ago. You know, Christian science is simple, but it's not superficial. There's a whole book here, the Bible, and it is filled with divine laws. You know, it's a wonderful way to read the Bible, especially the Psalms and the New Testament, looking for these divine laws. And sometimes it's these short statements that you might just read through, but pay attention to this. These are laws of God that you can use and apply in your life. And then there's this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. You know, if you haven't read this book before, you might start with a chapter on prayer. It's a great chapter to start with. Let me give you a few passages in here besides the one I've got in your handout that might be helpful to you. A page 275. 
275, all about God. In fact, at the top of 275, it starts off, the starting point of Christian science is, and then it tells you some things about God. It's, it's wonderful to start with. And that whole page is all about God. And you know, at the end of the page, it basically says, and this is the truth that heals. And you know, it's never talked about a disease. It's never talked about a problem. But just really understanding something about God, that is enough to heal. And then, um, if you want to work a little bit more with the qualities, maybe make a list of qualities for yourself and, and identify yourself with that list of good qualities several times a day. Um, you might go to page 115 to 116. There's some good moral and spiritual qualities there. You can add them to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That makes a great list to pray with. Um, page 475. This is a very spiritual view of man and woman. If you haven't prayed, if you, if you are unfamiliar with science and health, you might just substitute your own name in there or the person you're praying for. It gives you a very spiritual view. And you know, if you have been reading science and health and, and um, using it in your prayers before, um, you might think about pages 390 to 393. This, now this is in the middle of the book, so there's not a lot of explanation here. Mary Baker is just saying, do this. This is what you do. Do this, do that. Some very specific things. And, um, and let me just give you one more place. Um, this, this is if you've been reading science. If you haven't been reading science and health, start with a chapter on prayer and then just really pray about it and sort of open the book. Um, if you're looking for some divine laws, uh, look at the um, chapter Science, Theology, and Medicine and start with the science part because obviously science, you know, laws. You're going to bump into a lot of laws there. Um, so start with that chapter. Uh, but if you have been reading this book, Look at pages 412 to 418. In 412 to 418, you're going to see a lot of treatments, little embedded treatments, where Mrs. Eddy specifically says, pray in this manner. And there's lots of examples there. Um, it can be very helpful for you. God is always cherishing you. God sees all the good that is in you. God sees all the good that you are doing and that you want to do. God's guiding you. God is protecting you. God is keeping you safe. God is always with you. You are never alone. You are always cherished by God, safe in God. God is loving you. God loves you. And you can experience the healing power and grace of God in your life. Thank you very much.